Welcome to the Data, AI, and Everything podcast, where we delve deep into the evolving world of data science and artificial intelligence. In each episode, we engage with leading experts and visionaries who are at the forefront of transforming the landscape of data and AI. Join us as we unravel the complexities and envision the future through the experiences and insights of our distinguished guest. Absolute pleasure to welcome everyone. I'm David Hardoon, CEO of Avoid State Innovation, and I'm particularly excited to have Kay Firk Battlefield together with me. And in fact, one of our own advisory board member on ADI. Welcome, Kay. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I was preparing back in to do a bit of an introduction. And I realized no matter how hard I try, I am going to do a disservice. The background that you have in terms of currently CEO of Good Tech Advisory and still involved, if I believe, or have been essentially a key member in the World Economic Forum. Now, again, I won't go into your very illustrious career, but it's needed to say that very much been focusing on the governance, the law, the Sometimes I feel a bit hesitant of using the compliance because of the connotation of it, but truly these aspects of how we should be perceiving and recently more so in AI, machine learning, but in fact, from your background, going into other dimensions with respect to law, as I, I even called the book that you authored in terms of uh, human trafficking. So perhaps if I just jump straight into it, because there's so much I really want to ask, how did you get into AI? <laughs> oh, the long or the short story. So I think the short story is I have always been really interested in helping people. So you mentioned my pre-AI story, and that's really, you know, I was a barrister with the sort of lawyers that wear the wig and gown and go to court in England. And I was doing a lot of human rights work, a lot of work actually with human trafficking victims. And, and in that sort of work, you help one person at a time and you help them through some of the most difficult, critical moments of their lives. And then if you think of that as the golden thread that runs through my career, mm. when I, I decided to move to be uh, for a many reasons that we can talk about or not, but I'm doing the short story. Um, <laughs> I, we decide, I decided to become a professor. And as a professor, you uh, help a group of students, yeah. help your student on their path into hopefully a, a wonderful career and a wonderful life. And I got into AI back in 20... 11, when I read a, an article actually in the time, in time magazine and then read the singularity is near, which is oh. David Hart and David Hardy, which is, <laughs> I can't smile. I wish. On, yeah. on singularity. Yeah. And as writing this book on human rights and human trafficking that you just mentioned at the time. And really became fascinated by this idea of what would humans and a machine that powerful look like in, in their interactions together. And that just put me on the path that you find me on now, David. So That's... now I'm trying to help everybody. So I went from one to class to the world. So this is fascinating. And uh, two things very quickly, you said you, the, uh, the, the paper, the article, I think you mentioned times mm -hmm. in terms of singularity. So it's also interesting, uh, I don't know if it's a closing of a circle with your recent time AI Im impact award that if I just mentioned was with Yan Li Kun, obviously Meta, Song Wen Chuang, which is it's an artist and Karin Big Weir, if I'm pronouncing <laughs> the name correctly, which is from InstaD. That, that is just phenomenal in terms of the online recognition. So you obviously have been. <laughs> taking full-heartedly that impact towards how you can help everyone. And actually, that brings me to, to the question. And, and we briefly chatted this offline just before we started the, the podcast. You're coming still very much from that legal perspective, from the governance, from how we put in terms of safeguards. Maybe slightly being controversial, when you talk to the industrial world, usually that does not seem as you're going to help. It seemed that, oh, you're, you'll be stopping our abilities to do stuff. 
Now, obviously, I, I strongly don't believe that's the case, but why is that the case? Why is that kind of underlying view? And perhaps what is the, the changes that need to be instilled to, to truly demonstrate that taking this, and let's maybe perhaps use the term responsible AI to just capture all, this, uh, all facets of it, are about helping us as a whole. Yeah, I, uh, there are so many possible answers to that. And I think that they're, they're probably a group. But the, the idea of the internet was that it was going to help us all. And so then when we started building things on the internet, it felt as if that must be helping us all. I, it's also, I think that there was a lot of building build fast and break things. You know, it doesn't matter if you break things and then, and you still see people in big tech companies getting bonused on how fast they build something, for example. And there is one company that I won't name. If you're looking at a bonus is up to two times your salary is pretty big anyway, yeah. then it's about, the, it's about those incentives, isn't it? And, and I think the fact that there hasn't been any regulation around it means that companies have been able to lobby and generally take a perspective that ignores what is going on in society. And you can see that in deep fakes, you can see it in misinformation, you can see it in just trade negotiations and things like that. And, and I think it's also partly because of some of the views that are espoused by yeah. the people who lead companies. And if people who lead companies don't lead from the front about responsible AI, then it's very hard for anybody else in the business to think about responsible AI. Uh, the, the tone comes from the top. Absolutely. One of the things that we've talked about for quite a while is this needs to be at the board level and it needs to be at the level of the C-suite because the C-suite has to understand this, but also they have to permission other people to think about responsible AI. And that's one of the things just without us being sycophantic with one another. But <laughs> I was really grateful to you for asking me to join the advisory board of ATI because that's a public statement of we want to do this. No, absolutely. Uh, as I'm just reminded for the people listening, when I was the CDO at the Monetary Authority of Singapore and we came up with the fee principle, so fairness, accountability, transparency, I'm half joking about it, but we actually had an additional principle, which if I surmise it, basically said, don't commit crime. And we really scratched our head and it was like, do we really need to say that? Shouldn't it be absolutely painfully obvious? Now, you said something there that kind of really got me thinking. And I'm, I, I like to think of myself as an eternal, look, pragmatic optimist, eternal pragmatic optimist. I do try and strive for the good in terms of things. With that, but in the back of my mind, I wonder that perhaps organizations, company, if I kind of throw them a bone, as, as one would say, don't fully appreciate the impact the extent of the impact, the scale of the impact, and dare I say, the societal impact that may come from some of these AI applications. That the attitude that's taken is, oh, it's, we're, just, it's, we're just building a phone. We, we can recall it. Even the disastrous uh, uh, occasions that happens, let's say, with cars, when we suddenly discover that the brakes don't work, what do they do? They say sorry, pay a fine, and they recall it, but in a way, like problem fixed. But what I think we're finding, and, and please, I'd love to hear your views on this aspect, is and, and AI is different. It's almost, it's the genuine cases of Pandora's box that some things that once you let them out, no matter how much you hope, pray, dance, you can't put it back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I think about that is, well, Cars don't make decisions, or at least they didn't before we had <laughs> autonomous cars. But basically, any product that we previously sold were, was not capable of making decisions and was not, we weren't relying upon that for decisions. I've done a lot of work with health, with hospitals. 
And to begin with, the sort of work I was doing was helping them to think about writing a policy for their ER doctors using a chatbot because they were using the jackpot to check their diagnosis in an ER setting. We know, we who think about AI and think about generative AI a lot, know that's not probably the best idea. But if you, and that you should have a policy about that. But if you are the doctor on the front line and you've heard about this new thing, then you might decide to use it. And that problematic in itself and it's not that it's not that a lot of those people who are using the technology in a sort of secondary way so they're not creating it but they're using it they're using something that's potentially wrong but it is making decisions that would be life-threatening and and being a a great advocate of ai naturally you're absolutely right i was in fact as you're telling that story of in medical and dark type of situations, I was thinking, and look, this is public information, so I hope they don't get too mad at me for reminding it with Air Canada mm-hmm. and, the, and the refund policy that was created in, in as it goes, which you don't know. Maybe actually the kind of the, the chatbot did the wise thing and says, let's just jump all the hoops. I need to give you pay, pay back the money. But the reality of it is they were caught off guard and a decision was made without the consultation of wise people. Now, this kind of reminds me the AI governance framework in in various form published by different organizations, which kind of superimposes the element of materiality. Like some things may be an annoyance and you could just roll it back. Some things may have a very critical impact. Now, but that, and it's having come from a financial regulator and, and it's something that you also mentioned earlier, Kate, about the lack of regulation, which is now changing with the EC, which I'd love to touch on in a minute is there is still, and that's my view, an over obsession with the financial space in terms of how it's regulated, how it's then done. And to certain scenario, I would likely say that the financial regulators around the world have, have taken together with the privacy commissioners have taken the banister of driving this underlying view governance regulation with respect to AI. But to your point, exactly. Are we focusing in the right space? Because right or wrong, finance has regulation. So there's already a set of, of boundaries. It is the other industries which have, may have a, I don't want to say lower bar or no regulation. Isn't those the spaces that we should go, hold on a second. We really need to get this sorted here versus the areas which are, again, even if there's missing parts, but still have something. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. I agree with you entirely. Although I do, I do think that the financial regulators are very sensible in deciding to do something. Gary Gensler keeps telling us that AI might be responsible for this huge worldwide crash. But, but yes, everywhere you look, there are potentials. But there's potential for great good and great damage. And if I just think about great good. AI in healthcare is a wonderful place. And again, I think most people know that, or many people know, because I've talked about it in this context, that I had breast cancer last year. I'm better now, wholly Mm. better, through the miracle of modern science. But was I happy for an AI to read my, my mammogram? Of course I was, because we know it's really good. But... But in some cases, we've got, we see brilliant work happening, but in other cases, and I think that this is where perhaps it overlaps with the, the economic factors, maybe it's not so great in certain places. So let's take nurse AI, which I think is, this is NVIDIA and someone else, they're going to create a nurse that charges $9 an hour. That's brilliant if you live in a place where you can't get nurses. It's not so brilliant if you uh, are a nurse and you would like a job and you'd like to be paid more than $9 an hour. Is it going to depress the market for nurses? Do we need nurses who are human because of the bedside manners? 
And just coming from that, I saw my ecologist a couple of weeks ago and she said, look, Kay, I'm thinking that AI could help you with your cancer journey. And you can ask it questions all along the way. And I'm so, uh, and who wouldn't want that? And I actually mean, mm -hmm. I don't want that. I would like AI to help you with writing yeah. the notes and all that admin stuff that you do. So that you, the person, can help me through my cancer journey. And so you can see how there are yeah. amazing things to be done with it. And then there are the human to human interactions that we should also be having. This reminds me actually two things, perhaps half jokingly, quite a number of years ago. Now I was traveling through terminal five in Heathrow and this was before, this is really when I finished building it, it, it was in the era of automating everything to extent. I think it's been changed. And I, all I could remember on how cold it was, but even though it was brilliant and, and things worked smoothly, which is a great thing in the A. <laughs> It, it was like, I felt alone, which was, I felt odd because I, I put my thing, I scan, it works. I, I go through an auto, but it just felt lonely and just like half jokingly. But then on the other side, it, it's the eternal question that everyone brings up of, oh, it's going to take away all these jobs and all that. Now, obviously we're not naive. Is there going to be some degree of an impact? Of course, every iteration in every form or another has an impact for the good and for the bad. And the objective is to make sure that the good net net is significantly larger than whatever quote unquote bad. But it's also a matter of perspective and what you said right now, and I don't know if it's corny, I like to call artificial or AI, sorry, augmented intelligence, because it's that underlying mindset. And I, I like what you said, and if you don't mind, I think I'm going to borrow it in some of my <laughs> kind of talks is if you're talking about areas like take Philippines, take Indonesia, take places in Africa, or in fact, heck, even the outback in Australia. It, it could be anywhere whereby the extent and availability of nurses or schools or choose your picking is just not there. And the ability to bring those individuals out there comes at a significant premium. In fact, it reminds me, I, I lived in, I guess, the equivalent of the outback on the Red Sea and the ability of bringing experts down there, they would fly in specially and would cost slightly more because it was distant out of the center population, but it shouldn't be with a mindset of, oh, now this is staple. We're going to displace all nurses, all teachers. It should be there to support. It's there to enable. And if I just very briefly waffle on what, one of the things that I always love about the current era of AI is that it's truly unlocking the knowledge economy. And the analogy I like to give is the, it's, I call it the librarian. When I go and, and I used to be a, a massive bookworm. And I would go to the library. I literally would give myself assignments. The school thought I was weird. And I would like to research or write something about the Aztec or the Inca. And I would just ask the librarian, look, I'm interested about this. And they'll go, oh, David, you, you want to go to that shelf? You want to have a look at this book? They will point me mm -hmm. to an area to help me in that underlying process. They didn't go, oh, here, I wrote the essay for you. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and, and, and on the one hand, don't get me wrong, we're all, quote, we are, we're all human. And we want to take sometimes the easy road, but the other one is it's a realization that for us to go to that next level, business, personal, societal is we need to kind of balance out of saying, can I just laze about and do nothing? Yeah. Should I go to the gym? Should I actually do? Yes, I should <laughs> type of scenarios. So how do we do that? How do we almost break potentially this antagonistic, at, at, at some situations, still antagonistic, antagonistic barriers between the so-called drive of, oh, we're trying to progress the world. If I kind of paraphrase CEOs of companies, you know, they do worldwide too, we're trying to make everything better. And it's you guys that are stopping us. Whereas you're having us guys or, or the folks who are sitting on the other side, like, no, we want you to do that. Please put Put some guardrails. Perhaps certain things we're just not ready for. Or some things, it's the way we need to think of. How do we take that step forwards and make it more like synergistic, perhaps? I, obviously, first of all, I am a lawyer. And so I'm going to say regulation. <laughs> um, but I'm also going to say self-regulation. There are good companies doing self-regulation. 
There are also companies, even in Europe, saying we don't quite know what it's really going to be yet. And so we're waiting. And I don't believe that's the right approach. Do we have the luxury of time to wait? Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't have the luxury of time to wait. I think it's, I think, I, so regulation, self-regulation, I, education, I, Mm. I think it's really hard for people to have the conversation that they need to have about what our society should look like. If when we have these conversations, you and I know what we're talking about, but when somebody listening to them, listening to this conversation doesn't know what we're talking about and is trying to learn what we're talking about. I do think there's that piece. I also think that what we've seen is a number of regulators, for example, saying, okay, we haven't got any new regulation, but we've probably got these old laws that we could use that that we will use and see how that goes. And some of those have been very successful, like the EEOC here in, in the state. But really, what I would like is, like to see happening yeah. is for us to have a real conversation. We saw the Edelman Trust Barometer figures this year, about a month ago, and trust in AI is plummeting amongst individuals. Of course it is, because they tend to read the bad stuff, and it's right that journalists should be talking about the bad stuff, but they don't read that in the papers. And we know that there are so many problems associated with deep fake and the forthcoming election cycles and the potential for democracy being undermined. It's no wonder that people are losing confidence. But for those of us who want AI to succeed and really to be able to do those things that you were talking about that we need people to trust it. That's why we need guardrails. It, no, it's actually really fascinating you bring that. Because it, it, if you say, David, if you had a back time machine and you would go back and redo some of the policies that I personally had the pleasure to work on, I agree with you fully. The, the emphasis would truly be, two. not that the others are not important, but if you'd say I had to rank them, it would be trust and transparency, the two T's. Because transparency begets trust and, and, and trust requires transparency. So I find the two are intertwined, but I couldn't agree more with you. And in fact, this kind of reminds me of a conversation that we had early on in the series with uh, Donald McDonald, uh, who's the chief data officer at OCBC Bank uh, in Singapore. And he also pointed out that understandably bad news is good news from a PR, from, from a news kind of perspective, but that we need to talk about a lot more about the positive. We need to talk a lot more about the benefits and the outcomes, not from high level, but the actual ones that are being materialized. And there are many together with the, I I guess I call it the concerns and hence the actualization. And it goes back to what I was mentioning earlier about the context aspect of it is it, we also have to realize that AI isn't a zero and one game. We can equally say we're good to use it here. We're not quite yet good to use it here. It, it's not like all or nothing. And, and I love the answer, by the way, about the regulator, because I always used to get blamed because my answer to everything was like, we need a regulator. Uh, <laughs> oh, David, you're just saying that because you were a regulator. No, I truly believe we need one on some aspects because right now and today, regulators are industry verticals, finance, transportation, health, et cetera, maritime, and as they should be. But when you kind of ask yourself your question, who regulates data? And I don't mean privacy, data. Who establishes the frameworks, the guidelines, the governance, the good, the shouldn't, et cetera, and so forth. The, if you call a spade, that one doesn't exist. The privacy regulators have some, perhaps, at, 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 uh, I don't know, willingly or unwillingly, have taken on the responsibilities as well as some of the mm-hmm. vertical regulators. Mm-hmm. But I agree with you, it doesn't exist. And, and speaking of regulators, and, and maybe allow me to be a bit of devil advocate, because I, I would love to hear your views about the recent EC AI Act, mm-hmm. which even though is like second in the race because technically speaking china did come out with a, a ai regulation yeah. yeah now i hear a lot of comebacks on that one i say oh but i was like but 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 being fair they did come up with a framework for AI regulation Lucy. but i think ec has taken the, the more publicity has received more publicity in terms of that and also perhaps the the 
Qatar of being the regulator of the world. So that aside, I was sitting on a panel not too long ago. This was in uh, FinTech Week in uh, Japan. And I was sitting with three other individuals from three regulators. And I pointed out on the ECAI Act, and, and that's kind of where I'm getting out with my question is, I agree with it. I, I, I think, in fact, I think the exact word I used was, I spiritually agree with it. Yeah. I said, what worries me? And this is perhaps where I put the practitioner's view and lens. And I said, let me give you one example out of potentially many. It's broken down into four categories from prohibited to low risk, essentially, which makes logical sense. And from a legal structure point of view, can be enforced. But look at what's prohibited, social scoring. Now, again, I understand the rationale behind it and the intent. But now if I zoom back to in the world, the part of the world where I live of Southeast Asia, and I look at the, unfortunately, tens, if not in some cases in, together, hundreds of millions of people who are outside the formal financial system. Mm -hmm. There is no financial record of payments or of dealings, salary earning. It's not, it's not because they don't have that. It's just not formalized in the traditional financial setting that we're accustomed to. So if you now suddenly say, well, give me your pay slip or your three years of income in order to calculate and to provide your loan or, or credit card, that's just not possible. The only way to do it is using alternative data in one form or another. There have been attempts using telco, been some which have been using other forms, even logistics, et cetera, and so forth. And what I was getting at is that no matter how you look at it, and this is perhaps where you can also correct me, my view is that legally, it's a social score. Mm -hmm. So in a certain degree, it's a bit of a checkmate scenario whereby you're saying that social scoring is prohibited, understanding of what you're trying to prevent in terms of, oh, David, you can't take the bus because, I don't know, you, you did something on all that. Versus now a situation whereby I want to give you credit and the mechanism of calculation, even if it's rooted on the fundamentals of credit and credit the five C's, et cetera, and whatnot, because of the data used, it's a social score. But I don't know what sort of data you're using, David. So mm. <laughs> maybe I can't comment completely, but I don't see it perhaps in the same way that you do because they, they are... This is why I knew you're the best person to ask. <laughs> no, they are specifically getting at the harms. What you're trying mm. to do is actually get at the benefit. They're just specifically trying to stop people saying, no, you can't do this because you haven't got water. So I do think that there's an argument and a human rights argument at mm. that. Um, between what they're trying to prevent, which is um, shrinkage of our human rights, and what you're trying to get at, which is actually an expansion of our human rights in that you're going to allow them to have a bank account and, or a loan, and that will allow them to become wealthier and part of a community, and that actually will enhance their human rights. So in a sense, it's not actually... The, and, and, and See, this is why I knew I, I, I'm going to always leave the conversation richer after talking with you. So it's not in a sense, the social scoring per se, it is the usage of mm. the sco social scoring and the underlying impact associated, whereby if it results in, like you mentioned, the shrinkage of this realm of human rights or activities or capabilities that you can do as an individual versus the usage of Again, I'll use the term social scoring, scoring deliberately to enhance your potential rise. It essentially. Well, we, yeah. Well, we will have to see that, mm. that when, you know, whenever anything comes up as a lawyer, you say, okay, so, you know, what would lie within this? And yeah. what could I argue doesn't. <laughs> Yeah. It's really funny. And this is where sometimes I used to get a bit on my colleagues' nerves, if I'm fully honest, back in the day, is I always used to say, I read the spiritual essence of the law. <laughs> what is it that you're really trying to achieve? And then I would argue it from that perspective. But this is, again, it goes back to showing the good and bad flexibility and veracity of AI, which again, I, in fact, sometimes I'm even hesitant of using the word AI. It's knowledge. It is simply putting this phenomenal amount of information, which is getting more and more refined in a person's hand and how they can use it. 
And like you said, the, what we need to focus on, and I fully agree with you about self-regulation. You, you, again, I don't know if this is law, and I actually gave this as an example of one of the questions you asked me on slide, is that I, I don't know that the law exists that you need to look left and right across the road. But it's common sense and will help you sustain the ability to cross future roads. Yeah. Same thing. It's, yeah. Let me just share with you. I don't know. I think I ever told you this. So, you know, I've, despite my youthful looks, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I've been doing AI for a while. And I distinctly remember that many of the questions today, and, and let me take a hot one of, let's say, discrimination and gender and so forth. It just wasn't there. It's not because we were evil and malevolent individuals sitting with lab coats in and off. It, it, it just wasn't there. The, I would argue that as a society, we just haven't realized that potential implication. But the moment that knowledge got unlocked, while again, arguably the how to address it was still left open. And I think we're, let me just put it this way. I think we're a lot better in the tools of addressing it. Whether we are, that's a different question. But now we know. And now it's the element is you, you can't hide anymore. Do something about it versus situations that we don't know. And that goes back to my point about eternally uh, pragmatically optimistic is if I do the best I can to make sure that your rights are maintained as a customer and I make a mistake, hey, I will say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I had no intention. I didn't know. Again, obviously within context, because it can go in either direction and I will do better. Is it really hard to ask people to an organization to saying, do it, constantly have that attitude to do better? Yeah, it's yeah, tough. absolutely. It is if you're paying them to not care whether they do better or not. So that's one thing. I want to come back to this mm. data issue because it, it does worry me a great deal that the, it doesn't matter so much when you've got closed LLMs that are designed to for example, just look at scientific material. But if you've got the internet, then we all, we all know that there are real problems with the internet because right. the internet isn't actually representative yeah. of everybody in the world. It's not representative of the three billion pe people who don't have access to the internet because we don't collect any data about them. It's not representative of women like me because I haven't been writing as much as men who are white and living in the global north. They've had the they've had the pen for eon. And although it's giving us all the knowledge that we have, it's actually not giving us the representative we need to change our society so that we see our society in a different way. And it's really important that when we're using these tools, we have that in mind. Absolutely. And, you know, that's one thing about data. Another thing about data is that if we could harvest better data, then we could do better jobs. You know, who's interested in collecting data about flooding in Bangladesh, for example? Obviously, the Bangladeshis are, but... Is it of sufficient monetary value for some of the tech companies? So we've got, it's those things as well. If we're truly going to do good, we need to collect the data that's actually going to enable us to good, do good. So I think those are two things that I wanted to just talk about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Data. But also, just in, in, in 15 minutes, you can... Uh, something uh, you can use an LLM to create 15,000 plus pages, which will point to a particular website and then skew ranking on a search engine. And we're, we're seeing more and more, obviously, AI creating <clears throat> its own data and then using it again. And that we need to have this conversation and it's not happening at the right level. And oh, absolutely. Right, obviously, absolutely. If you're using it in your, in uh, API because you're using closed data. No, absolutely. No, this is extremely important point. And I, I don't know if I have the words ironically, but it, to me at least, further justifies the necessity of having a data regulator, perhaps in one point in future, even part from a global element. Obviously, there are 
international aspects, it has its own challenges because mm -hmm. data begets, again, even skewed data to a certain degree begets transparency. Transparency means openness. So the challenges, but to your point, it, it becomes extremely important because A, it's the ability of commoditizing and sharing the knowledge about it. So for example, I remember I was having a conversation with someone that, and similar to you were saying, they look all the data, let's say in, in lending, because you know, obviously I was doing for many years work on the financial side of the house. It, in Europe, it's predominantly a middle-aged white men. And, and we can't do that. And I said, look, you see the mere, the moment you say that, that becomes a data point. That means I can build it. It's just, I'm going to use common sense. And if someone doesn't fall into that demographic, I may not use those underlying models. But it, so a data regulator, and I think this is where, again, those boundaries between, and, and let's just call it governance and innovation, need to be a lot more harmonious. Not even, I'm not even using the word balance, it's harmony, yeah. is providing that information, having that knowledge, because then it can help. We need to drive it. But to the point that you mentioned earlier with respect to, uh, literally, that, that the only word I can describe is that's data manipulation. Someone needs to call it out and saying, look, just like market manipulation is not allowed, it's a big no. Guess what? Data is the market in many places. Yes. You are doing market manipulation in its data aspect. And someone has to put the standard to place there and rigor as an underlying offense. You've seen it in some countries, in Singapore, where I reside, you have this thing called POFMA, which I always forget what it fully stands for. But long story short, it's about online falsehoods. Or in other words, deliberate, inaccurate information that's seeded with a deliberate intent where there is a legal capability saying, sorry, you're not allowed to, you have to pull it off. If not, we're going to come after you with a big stick. So I, I fully agree. And then maybe it's just the last point. And because I know from your background perspective, it's, it's also on an international aspect. It's the, the, I guess, readiness. And I don't use the word maturity, perhaps the stage of development, if I put it that way, of countries. Mm -hmm. A developing country will simply, obviously, not have as much data as a developed country. So now when you think about from a development of a solution, we were talking about earlier, healthcare. If we're building a solution on one type of society, culture, demographics, and then trying to just lift the shift it to another because we simply don't have the data, again, in certain scenarios that may work perfectly well, in certain scenarios may not. And there needs to be this cognizant awareness because the last thing you want is this trend of tribalism and localization and all that because of, I, I don't want this to be a form of the modern colonialism of rather than coming and conquering me, you're doing it indirectly through data. Yeah, it's, yeah. You know, it's surfacing that up. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. No, I agree. And you could easily do that because you could be to the victor of the spoils. <laughs> <laughs> so you could find that the education that your AI is giving in different places in the world is not the education that they might have chosen for themselves unless we allow people to make those choices and to and unless we are prepared to create the models that are sorry, models that allow them, yeah. that allow those histories and those, the way that a, a society sees itself to be committed w w within the AI. Yeah. So having obviously engaged with the industry world tremendously, obviously the, the regulatory legal one, and if, if you, and I'm going to ask the impossible, but I'm going to still ask it anyway. If you'd surmise it to a line or two or a couple of steps, what, what would you tell both? To get to that point that we need to, what will be that, what will be that, literally the advice that you say to the one who's about out to make money and something, nothing wrong with making money, but those who are out there for making money and commercial success and so forth, and the one out there who's standing at the vanguard from a society regulatory perspective, what would be your advice? I think actually the companies are easier to do <laughs> because <laughs> with companies, what we know and the North American CEO of Accenture spoke very eloquently about this on my panel at Davos this year is that companies that have developed AI applications without having responsible AI, an eye to responsible AI 
And now very expensively having to take them apart so that they can rebuild them with responsible AI. So my two companies, what I tend to say is if you've got AI in the company, you need to map out first where it is. And then you need to say, okay, so these applications over here are not damaging and they are useful. And these over here could be extremely damaging and we haven't put guardrails in place. We don't perhaps have a responsible AI policy. And so those are the ones that you need to just leave here a moment until you underpin them with responsible AI. And responsible AI doesn't mean to say that you're not going to make money. It mm -hmm. actually means in the long term that you're going to make more money because you're yeah. not going to get things wrong. You're not going to have these customers who don't trust you very much anyway because you're using AI turned off. And I think you've proved this in your own work. You will actually be able to innovate whilst you're using responsible AI as well. So I, it's not a... Oh, there is those lawyers mm. there that we've got to do it for. It's actually a holistic benefit to the company. So I think that's that the company is easier for countries. Countries do have to balance their economy against what policies they put in place. But at the moment, the most important thing that any country could be doing is really thinking about how do we manage the misinformation will yeah. potentially screw with our you, you, <laughs> of our election. <laughs> mm. Absolutely. I mean, I always say, and I remind people out there is while we're having the correct and rightful debates and discussion and discourse on these topics, the bad actors are not worried about what regulation or policies in place. Absolutely. They're just getting on with it. No, absolutely. I, well, okay, yeah, right on that, I was talking to a friend today and he was saying that there is a scam out there. So I, Medicare is the healthcare that you get as an American yeah. citizen yeah. as you turn 65. And there's a scam out there at the moment that provides all the data, the AI builds all the data that you could possibly need for respiratory con condition, a claim for respiratory mm -hmm. condition. And it, for, and it claims just $200 because that's the level at which they Just don't the, bother yeah, to, yeah. to say, no, we'll fight that or we'll look into it. But it's also, also thousands pay. of these claims every day. And of course, older people during winter often get respiratory. So it's just not being picked up. And it's that the cost to a country, even as big as America, the cost to a country it is of bad actors is just horrendous. It's so, okay. It's absolutely always the depth that we can go into this. If I just want to just say two things, perhaps to wrap the two things together. One is whether you're an industry or whether you're a regulator. And, and I actually want to emphasize that particularly to your point, the, the countryside is that we can't wait, we can't wait. And, and the potential risks and the loss of opportunity, if you look at it from that perspective. In trying to get the hundred percent, it's just not worth it. Even if you got fifty percent, you're far better off. Just get on with the fifty percent. We will figure it out. Again, take that attitude of course correction along the way, which I fully appreciate. For state actors, is a lot more difficult mm -hmm. to do, but it's something that we need to realize. And then the second one is, it's the mindset. And if I, if I not to put words in your mouth, but really summarizing the last points that. Policy and regulation and good governance creates innovation. It breeds innovation. It doesn't stifle. It, it doesn't stifle business. Obviously, with the extreme case of saying you really should not, you're not allowed to do that. But again, these are the, we shouldn't assess ourselves on the skewness of the distribution. We should look at the, the rough of the bell curve in the middle. It, it, it enables us to innovate, to create businesses, to create opportunities. While assuring that in the end of the day, and if we go to the broader line theme of Davos included, as well as COP, et cetera, and whatnot, sustainable, mm -hmm. that it is sustainable, that it's not a one-off hit wonder, that it's something that continuously generates benefits and opportunities for us industrially, country-wise, and more importantly, as individuals. And I think that's, to me, the view that I have with respect to AI and why I'm keen about it. 
Okay. I yeah. just want to say again, thank you so very much. <laughs> thank I, you. I feel like we need to have a, a second iteration of the podcast because there's so much more that we can go into. But again, thank you so very much for coming on board. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us this week on the Data, AI, and Everything podcast. Make sure you visit our website at aboetesdayatinnovation.com, where you can subscribe to the podcast and find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 